Tim, are we good? We're good. That's good that we're good. We weren't good. We were having some demonic interference with Facebook, just like we had demonic interference with GoToMeeting last Wednesday night. And Kirk said that's why we're delayed, but we'll catch up. Not on my watch, we ain't catching up. <laughs> All right, if you'll please join me. Ephesians chapter 5. Father, as we turn in the word, we ask that you would give us the gift of teaching to understand the passage of scripture before us this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so last week, in earlier in this chapter and beyond, through the beginning of chapter 4, as we consider the fact that we live in perilous times, spiritually fierce times, in a world that is troubled, a world that is in upheaval, how do we keep pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ? How do we keep our bearings? Well, we follow Jesus. And starting in chapter 4, verse 1, we walk worthy of the calling of God with lowliness, meekness, and boldness. We walk not as the young believers do in the depravity of their minds. We walk in love as Jesus loved us. Last week, we walk as children of light, and now, as we move forward in chapter 5, we walk circumspectly, redeeming the time. So the passage that we're going to look at this morning starts in chapter 5, verse 15. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So circling back up to verse 15, this section uh, following Jesus by working, or, excuse me, walking circumspectly. It means to live a, a lifestyle before God and before man diligently, overlooking nothing. In Matthew chapter 2, when the, the kings from the east came to worship Jesus, and they stopped at Jerusalem and asked where is the king of Israel? And so they searched, and in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, oh, he's in Bethlehem. Well, Herod said, sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him. No, make sure you find him. Search diligently. Overlook no place. That's how we are to walk circumspectly. The word also means to uh, live carefully, always on guard. We can never let our guard down. It always must be up. When the children of Israel were at Mount Sinai and the Lord had introduced himself to them and he'd given Moses, written by his finger in the tables of stone, the Ten Commandments, uh, through Moses, he said to them, In all things that I've said unto you, be circumspect and make no mention of the name of other gods. Neither let it be heard out of your mouth. Be careful. Be always on guard. You're going to a land that I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and there's a bunch of idol worshipers there. Do not be circumspect. The word also means perfectly, to live perfectly uh, without any doubt. Luke, when he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to record the Gospel of Luke, he said in chapter 1, verse 3, that it seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write thee in order. He had a perfect understanding of what he was going to be recording, which means he had no doubt it was all true. And we also have no doubt, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2, for yourselves know perfectly 
that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. To walk circumspectly before God and man is to live a lifestyle that is diligent and careful and without doubt. And moving on, not this but that. We'll see the contrast through this section of scripture. Do not walk circumspectly, verse 15, not as fools but as wise. We walked long enough as fools. True? Chapter 2, just let's read it again. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And you who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. That's living like a fool. But God. Ah, there's wisdom. But God. So we are going back to chapter 5 then. We are to walk with the living God, who is the God of the living. And it is wise to believe him, to love him, to obey him, and to serve him. Uh, we read corporately Psalm 101. Uh, who's, who's doing that speaking? Who's saying that he's not going to have anything to do with a wicked person? Who's saying he's not going to have anything to do with a proud person? Who's saying that he can, he's going to deal with all the wicked people? Who's saying? Who's speaking in Psalm 101? The Lord Jesus. But... Let's consider Psalm 1. We looked at Psalm 101. Let's look at Psalm 1. Psalm 1, starting in verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, and the way of the ungodly shall perish. The righteous are wise. The ungodly are foolish. The Lord knows the difference. Uh, and while we're there, turn the page, if you must, to Psalm 3. Starting verse 1. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there's no help for him in God. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter of my head. When we look around on the horizontal, what do we see? Fools, foolishness, wickedness, ungodliness. And it's easy to be drawn in by that. What does the Lord do? points us to him and everything changes as we do that uh, going back to Ephesians chapter 5 uh, the fool says in his heart that there is no God the fool fights against the will of God just like King Saul did just like Saul of Tarsus did Proverbs 11 says that the fool shall be a servant to the wise in heart Psalm 49 says the fool trusts in his wealth, but just like a brute beast, he perishes. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 says the fool walks in darkness. And so the fool lives, you take all those things considered, uh, the fool lives a wasted life, trashing a very precious and priceless gift from the Creator. Life and time don't live like a fool but as wise uh, wisdom is the word of God 
Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord, and that's from Psalm 19. The fear of the Lord is the word of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Wisdom is the word of God. Oh, and the word of God is wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Jesus is the word. He is the living word. He is wisdom. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. The world is awash with deceit, and delusions. And now, of course, we know where it comes from. It all comes from the devil. But the world and the flesh feed on that. A couple examples of delusion in the world. Uh, first of all, this is a delusion. It is legally and morally right to slaughter defenseless babies in their mother's womb. This past week, elections, even conservative states, enshrined that delusion in their state constitutions. Death to babies is the defining election issue in this country right now. It's a delusion. Another delusion, obvious perhaps, uh, radical Islam. They've got a, a chant, from the river to the sea. What does that mean? From the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea will be theirs. Not a two-state solution, one state, theirs. It's, it's a mantra to get rid of Israel as a nation to annihilate all the Jews. It's a delusion. Why is it a delusion? Because it's impossible. It's absolutely impossible in Jeremiah chapter 31 Jeremiah 31 starting verse 35 thus saith the Lord which giveth the sun for a light by day and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night which divided the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. Have any of those things happened? Can any of those things ever happen? No. When is Israel going to be a nation? Every day. Every day. Chapter 33, same book. Starting verse 19. Jeremiah 33, 19. And the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, if ye can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, and that there should, be, should not be day and night in their season, then may also my servant be, excuse me, then also my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne, and with the Levites the priests my ministers. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, wait a minute, Jesus, God has numbered the stars and he's put them exactly where he wants them and he's named them all. But from man's perspective, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David my servant and the Levites that minister unto me. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Considerest thou not what this people have spoken, saying, The two families which the Lord has chosen, he has even cast them off? Thus they have despised my people, that they should no more be a nation before them. 
Thus saith the Lord, if my covenant be not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then will I cast away the seed of Jacob and David my servant, so that I will not take any of his seed to be rulers over the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for I will cause their captivity to return and have mercy on them. Who is the son of David that's going to reign over? Not just Israel, but all the nations. Jesus. Did the sun come up today? Is it going to go down tonight? Are we going to see the moon tonight? Is the sun going to come up tomorrow? When is the sun not going to come up? No, it's going to always come up until this universe goes up in fervent heat. When will Israel cease to be a nation? Who says? God does. So radical Muslims saying we're going to annihilate the Jews, that's a delusion. It's not going to happen. And that delusion has infected the entire planet. And I don't know if this be true or not, but join me in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Because we don't know what it is. But I wonder if that delusion, that we're going to annihilate the Jews, we're going to destroy Israel as a nation, I wonder if that is the strong delusion that is championed by the counterfeit Christ. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Get a run and start at it, starting in verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye, ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by the letter as from us, as at the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that that son of man be revealed, the son of perdition. This is the Antichrist, of course. When is he revealed, by the way? When the church is gone, when the bride of Christ has been taken off the earth. Who, this, what does he do? He opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing, declaring himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth, that he may be revealed in his time. The church is withholding that evil on the earth. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The mystery of iniquity is tamped down, not fully revealed because the church is on earth. When the Holy Spirit abiding in the church is taken off the earth, then Katie bar the door. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all powers and signs and lying wonders. Miracles can be lies. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Is this, we're going to annihilate the Jews, we're going to destroy the nation of Israel, which is a delusion. Is that the strong delusion of the counterfeit Christ? I don't know. I don't know. What else about radical Islam? They have a covenant with death for themselves. Soldiers of Hamas say, we want to be martyrs. If you're a martyr, what, what happens? You die. Why do they want to die? Because they believe the delusion from Allah. Who is Satan in the Bible? And that delusion is, if you die a martyr, you got paradise. But Satan's paradise is the Bible's hell. It's a delusion. And even in Gaza and other places, parents help 
their children, sons and daughters, be martyrs. And then they celebrate them when they are. Utterly deceived with this delusion. What else about radical Islam is a delusion? Well, follow the money. If you follow the money, you will find fools who believe this delusion. For example, uh, this spirit of Jew hatred is in the United States Congress. They banded together, they're known as the squad. They receive many thousands of dollars from nonprofit organizations that support Hamas. What about our universities? American universities have received over 13 billion dollars from Muslim nations. And so when this radical Muslim delusion is paraded and demonstrated, the universities are silent. They're not willing to condemn the Jew hatred of their students. And so here we have the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's looking down from heaven on earth. And what does he see in this nation? Well, he sees spiritual wickedness in high places. True of every government, true of this one also. Maybe even to the very highest place in this government. He looks down and he sees American universities that are covetous. They love money. And the love of money is the root of all evil. And he looks down and he sees radical Muslims giving money to both people in the government and to the American universities. Now, on the other side, Jewish billionaires are withholding their, starting to withhold their donations from these American universities, but there's no budging yet. And if things continue, the American universities are going to produce the next generation of leaders in the United States, leaders who have the worldview of the squad. That which is the minority is going to become the majority. That's where we're headed. If things don't stop, if there isn't repentance, if there isn't a mighty movement of the Holy Spirit, if the church somehow isn't more vocal than she is now. Just follow the money, and you'll find the fools. Well, here's another delusion in this country. There are more than two genders. Gender is fluid. Gender is a choice of the person. It's utter nonsense. Another delusion we've seen in this country, that our cities will be safer, and, city, excuse me, and racism will end if we just defund the police. Well, how's that worked out? Delusion leads to death. And fools are pro-death. God is pro-life. He is wise. Wisdom starts with him. Fools who reject the wisdom of God, they are pro-death. And they're all around us. And in the context of our study last night, we are like a lily among the thorns which fit only for burning. Back to Ephesians 5. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. To redeem time means a couple of things. First of all, it means not wasting time. Time is perishable. Elsa, if they don't sell every seat on a flight you're on before it takes off, it's perishing. They're, they're not going to have any revenue from a seat no one's sitting in. Airline seats are perishable. Time is perishable. When it's gone, it's gone. Ain't ever coming back. It's a gift. It's perhaps Next to life, the most precious gift God gives to us, and it demands wise, godly stewardship. That we don't waste it. That was drilled into my head as a kid from Depression-era parents. You don't waste money, you don't waste clothes, you don't waste food, you don't waste time. 
but redeeming the time therefore also means taking advantage of every opportunity to love and to obey and to serve the Lord knowing because God has so said and we believe that he has purchased us with his blood we are not his own excuse me we are not our own we are his purchased possession he gives us time how should we invest our time in the things that the one who purchased us wants to do and so the wise take inventory regularly maybe even every day how much time today did I waste how much time did I spend wisely after all how many lives do we have here on earth we're not like cats <laughs> we have one life and what does scripture say about that one life that period of time it's like a vapor James 4:14. 4, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes away. It's like a fog. Early in the morning, when the sun comes up, it's over. Job had to say in chapter 14, verse 1, that man is born of man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Psalm 103 verses 15 and 16 says as for man his days are as grass as a flower of the field so he flourisheth for the wind passes over it and it is gone and the place thereof shall know it no more we have one life and it's fleet it's a vapor so scripture exhorts us to be wise with this gift of time. Psalm 90, starting in verse 10, says the days of our years are three score years and ten. What's a score? What's three score? Plus ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. We're exhorted to number our days. Seventy years is 25,567 days. Eighty years is 29,220 days. As of today, as I stand here today, the number of my days is 25,026. Which means what? I'm running out of time. Yes? Bob and Marie, are you running out of time? Evan? We're all running out of time. Psalm 102, verse 11 says, My days are like a shadow that declineth and I am withered like grass. Does that bum me out? No! Absent from the body is present with the Lord. Which is better, here or there? But what it does do is it creates urgency, and it creates imminency, and that's exactly what the Lord wants us to have. So the wise take every opportunity to love and to serve and to obey the Lord and they pursue the truth the fools waste time serving themselves and pursuing lies but what is in all of our future an appointment where's that appointment in heaven with whom Jesus where his judgment seat what happens there? Our lives, our time, is refined by fire. And that which was foolish is wood, hay, and stubble. And it burns up and there's nothing to show for it. But that which is wise is gold, silver, precious jewels refined by fire. And then, then what does he give us? A crown 
What do we do with the crown? Put it where it belongs. Not on us, but at his feet. Don't you want to throw a really nice crown at his feet? You have to be wise and not foolish. And we were talking a little bit about this on, on Monday because of your, your wing. Uh, you're going through physical therapy to, to strengthen your arm after surgery. Uh, physical therapy is used to strengthen these bodies that have a, a lifespan of a vapor. And it, physical therapy is used for illnesses, it's used for injuries, when you're limited in your range of motion and, and, and just doing normal things, physical therapy is used to strengthen the body to get that all back. And treatment plans are devised with exercises and you know, massage and this, that, and that, and I twist and all sorts of things, uh, heat and cold to bring about more motion and healing. And it helps you recover from uh, surgical procedures but it also helps to avoid surgical procedures in the future. And physical therapists, uh, they work very hard to restore the mobility of these bodies, which is inhibited by aging and injury and disease and all sorts of things. Well, if we're gonna do that to this body that has the lifespan of a vapor, how much more so should we do spiritual therapy to strengthen our spiritual bodies which have a lifespan of all eternity. Spiritual therapy. The early church, Acts 2.42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the word of God, and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayer. We need to take inventory of our time. I think we should also take inventory of the things and the people that steal precious, unrecoverable time. Things and people who keep us from daily Bible reading, meditating on the Word of God, even studying the Word of God, that keep us from Sunday morning worship, especially in person, that keep us from Bible studies, be it Tuesday or Thursday or Wednesday or whatever, or whatever you got going on in your life, Bible studies that you're leading, things that and people that keep us away from fellowship in the, in the body of believers and celebrating the, the Lord's table together and praying with and for each other because we all have those things. And last night we talked about little foxes. They're little foxes. They're going to chew the vine down and bring destruction. We've got to get rid of the foxes, the little foxes. And as a physical therapist puts together a treatment plan to help the physical body, we have to put together a treatment plan to increase the strength of our spirit. And who does that? The spirit of God. He gives us tool, the word of God and prayer. And he stretches us. Anybody like stretching? I don't. You know, I play softball. I stretch. <laughs> not really. You know, I, I do a little bit. Uh, I don't do too much because I know I'm not going to run that hard. But it also hurts. <laughs> stretching hurts. It's not comfortable. But it does build strength. And there's value in stretching. What value does a rubber band have? Zero. Until it's stretched. Then it has value. We need to be stretched spiritually to build our spiritual strength. And what kind of kids does our Father in Heaven want? Strong ones, not weak ones. Especially in these days in which He's appointed us to live because the days are evil. Evil men are getting worse and worse. Seducers are getting worse and worse. They're deceiving themselves. They're deceiving others. And it seems like suddenly, explosively, the boldness of evil has exploded all around us. 
We see the lawlessness that was in the days of Noah. Yesterday made my blood boil. Veterans Day, New York City. Radical Muslims climbing a pole to rip down the American flag and the Israeli flag and to burn it. On Veterans Day. And where were the police? Nowhere to be found. In all the major cities in this country, uh, it's like all the retail establishments are, come on in, take whatever you want. You know, theft is unrestricted, unrestrained, and unpunished. What is called evil is called good, and what is called good is called evil. You know, we see exploding in this nation the bold and shameless sexual perversion of the LGBTQ plus trans drag crowd, just like in the days of Lot. All this deception fits into the, the beginning of sorrows. Matthew chapter 24, just before Jesus comes to earth, it's going to be, deception is going to be everywhere. This demonic spirit of Jew hatred worldwide. We continue to see these marches throughout the cities of Western civilization. And is it a couple people? No, it's a couple thousand or a couple tens of thousands. It's huge. And when you look at those marches, what do you see? You see people who are on the broad way that leads to destruction. And my first reaction is always in the flesh, it seems like. It makes me angry. But then the spirit convicts me. It breaks my heart to see all these people willingly marching themselves right into hell. And no doubt, it breaks our Father's heart also. This nation has become pro-death. But the abortion issue is more important than inflation, than the economy, than foreign affairs, than anything. It is the defining issue in the elections in our country today, including the red states. So what, what are the Republicans going to do? What do you think they're going to do? My thought, they're going to take note. And they want power. So what are they going to do? They'll abandon the unborn as they seek power. I, I see it coming. Proverbs 8.36 says, All they that hate me love death. So I'm sure you all can see it. I hope it's getting more clear day by day that we as children of light are behind enemy lines. And the spiritual battle is absolutely raging. It's not quiet or subtle anymore. It's loud and it's bold and it's everywhere. We very well might be witnessing the last generation before worldwide judgment comes again. Therefore, let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. And we clearly see that day approaching. Verse 17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Don't be unwise, but understanding. Don't be deceived and deluded and confused and ignorant and stupid and have no common sense. Not understanding the times. Part of the people that rallied to David were from the tribe of Ishakar. And they were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. We need to be like that. Understanding the will of God. Not unwise, like the Pharisees, who Jesus called out and says, Oh, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the sign of the times? 
And what was the times that he was referring to? His first coming. The servant of God coming to earth. They could not discern the times. They were foolish. The only way to understand the times in which we live is to understand the Bible. And by understanding the Bible, we understand the will of God. To understand the will of God, you've got to know you got to know God. You have to know the Lord to understand his will. First things first. Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 24 says, But let him glory, the glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. To understand the will of the Lord, you have to know the Lord. And ultimately, we'll have a very clear understanding after he takes us off the earth to the throne room. And there in the throne room, we will sing, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. What are we? creatures who created us the Lord God Father Son Holy Spirit why for his pleasure what's the meaning of life Alfie Jesus to understand the will of the Lord we have to know the word of God Timothy excuse me Paul would write to Timothy in his second letter, chapter 2, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Who should study to show themselves approved that they're able to rightly divide the word of God? Who? Every one of us. You got kids? You got grandkids. You got siblings? We all have a ministry in the Word. We have to study it. What's it take, Ken? Just wondering. You know. Israel didn't take the time and the effort. They didn't know the Lord. They walked after the gods that should not have been, even been named. And he sent them prophet after prophet after prophet, which they killed. But ultimately he vomited them off his land. But he promised to bring them back because he is faithful to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And they came back by the decree of Cyrus to rebuild the temple. And they got discouraged. But Ezra the priest in Nehemiah 8.8 8 says, So they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Ezra, the high priest, read the word of God and taught them what it meant. Four verses later in chapter 8, verse 12, And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth because they had understand the words that were declared unto them. Under, you know, hearing the word of God and having it explained to you causes joy. But not always. Speaking personally, I've had someone tell me, you know, after you teach a passage of scripture, I really understand it. I know what it means. So we're leaving the church. <laughs> okay uh, whatever to understand the will of God we have to understand the Lord we have to understand the word of God we have to have ears that are able to hear what the spirit is saying to the churches Jesus said so t eight times he that has ears to hear let him hear and he would 
say it through the Apostle John in the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. We live in spiritually fierce times. So in these times, what is the will of the Lord? Well, let's look at some things. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2, starting verse 1, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will, this is his desire, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Jesus died for whom? All men. He bore the sins of all men. God put the sins on his son and his wrath for them. What is God's desire of every man? To be saved. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. God's desire, he's long-suffering, clearly. His desire is that none should perish. Perish is the second death. To have your last breath defying, despising, rejecting Jesus Christ and God's gift of love and grace through him. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, Moses is about to end his ministry and pass the baton to Joshua, and Joshua is going to lead him across the Jordan River to their inheritance. And he says to them, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is your life and the length of days. He wants a right relationship with every one of his creatures, possible only by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. The son of David, Solomon, and when he was old, embarked on a grand experiment Let's see what makes me happy. And he did everything. He had the wherewithal to do everything. At the end of his book, chapter 12, verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole of man. We're made whole in a right relationship with our creator. Jesus gave us, you know, speaking to us, the, the, the bride of Christ, the believers, uh, what does he want in these crazy times? Well, he, want, he gave us one commandment, and what's that commandment? To love one another. As I've loved you, love each other. Why? So that the world will know that you are my disciples. And he exhorted them, continue in my word and you will be my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. We're in bondage. Jesus came to set us free. Continue in it. We're to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, acceptable to God. And that's reasonable. He's purchased us with his blood. We're not our own. We're not to be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our mind. What kind of a mind do we need? The mind of Christ. And with the mind of Christ, we'll know the perfect will of God. And Luke, let's, let's look at it. Luke chapter 21. What does the Lord want for us in these days? those who are his own. And he knows who are his own. Luke 21. It 
Start in verse 28. And when these things, all the things that are going to happen on earth before Jesus returns to earth, life will be like the days of Lot. It's going to be like the days of Noah. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. He does not want his bride to be surprised. He tells his bride what he's doing. Slide down to verse 34. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. And so what day come upon you, that day come upon you unawares. Don't be surprised. Don't let the things of the world cloud your vision and, and distract you. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. What are all the things that shall come to pass? Revelation 6 through 16. Don't want to be here. Don't want to be distracted. Got to keep our eye on the prize, no matter what's going on in this world. Back to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Don't be under the influence of a, an intoxicating beverage. How did a beverage become intoxicating? Its nature was changed. There was an introduction of something, leaven or yeast, that created a chemical reaction like unto death. And it produces a counterfeit high. It dulls the mind, clouds the eyes, slurs the speech, distorts perception, and it leads to riot. It's foolishness. We're to be wise, not foolishness. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 19. Jesus, uh, the Lord through Moses said, if you obey these blessings, if you disobey these curses, at the end of which he said in chapter 29, verse 19, it came to pass when he heareth the words of this curse, the consequences of not believing, not obeying the word of God, that he bless himself, someone blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of my heart and add drunkenness to thirst. I'm okay. That's not going to happen to me. I got this. Not a problem. That's foolishness. King David had, had a, a wife. He had more than. But one of them was Abigail. Remember who Abigail was married to beforehand? A guy named Nabal. Hmm. What's the meaning of the name Nabal? Fool. Hi. What's your name? I'm Abigail. Who's your husband? Oh, fool. <laughs> be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The true high, the real high, the lasting high is to be spirit-filled and spirit-led. Under the influence of God. In 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4, starting verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, unbelievers, when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. 
wherein they think it, they, the unbelievers, they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. What are you talking about? What's this Jesus saying? You used to go out party with me all the time. What happened to you? I don't like you anymore. Who are you? Verse 5, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Live under the influence of God, not under the influence of a substance. Back to Ephesians, verse 19. Speaking to yourselves as, as we're living under the influence of God, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Speak as Jesus spoke, as Jesus speaks. Speak as the Father speaks. Speak as the Holy Spirit speaks. Speak to each other that way as members of the family of God. Speak spiritually, not carnally, not things secular, but be encouraging and edifying and com comforting and exhorting, always pointing your brother or your sister to Jesus. Especially as we see the day approaching. And verse 20, under the influence of God, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When are we to give thanks? What's outside of always? When is Thanksgiving? Every day. What are we to give thanks for? Are there any exceptions? Well, what if it's something bad? All things do work together for good. Do we know how? No. We know who. And that's sufficient. We do know if God be for us, who can be against us? And that Jesus is at the right hand of God interceding for us. And that we're more than conquerors through Jesus. And that nothing, no one, can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And that the sufferings of this world cannot be compared with the glory that is going, is going to be revealed in us. Does that make it easy to, to make our way through? No. Did Job have it easy? No. Did Job sin? Blessed is the Lord who, you know, well, let's read. Job 1. After losing everything, including his children, Job said in chapter 1, verse 20, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down on the ground and complained. No. Worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, no, nor charged God foolishly. And then his wife starts chirping. Right? Chapter 2, verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Oh, I love you too, sweetie. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil, or calamity is what that means? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. And then he had three friends show, four friends show up. Friends like this you don't need. And we all have to be mindful, because we all go through stuff. 
Sometimes it's for a short period of time. Sometimes it's for a long period of time. Sometimes it's in the middle. We all go through stuff. We have to be very, very mindful always to never be Job's friend. Was it easy for Jeremiah? Last prophet sent to a dying nation. One or two converts, maybe, for 47 years of ministry. Nothing to show for it. And at one point, he was absolutely fed up. He said in chapter 20, verse 7, O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. They mock me. Why are they mocking him? Because he's speaking the word of God. For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. All I got was trouble when I said what you told me to say. I'm done. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name, but... His word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing and could not stay. I'm not saying another word. Thus saith the Lord. He could not but speak the word of God, no matter how bad things got for him. So we are to pray, or we're to give thanks always. We're to give thanks for all things, and we are to give thanks to whom? The Father, the overarching relationship now and forever, and we're to give thanks always for all things to God and the Father. How? In the name of Jesus Christ, according to his character, according to his nature, no one, no one suffered as Jesus suffered. But he gave thanks always. Now, back to Ephesians chapter 5, also, living under the influence of God, verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. God is the God of order. He's not the author of confusion. We see a lot of confusion around us. It's not coming from him. We know where it's coming from. He's the God of order. Order requires humility and submission. Can you think of anybody who modeled humility and submission for us? Jesus. Absolutely. Even in his greatest trial, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, not my will, but thy will be done. He submitted to the Father. And we're to take his yoke, like an ox. We're to take his yoke, a willing bondservant. Not, not like a stiff-necked ox, which is absolutely worthless. We follow him. In Romans 12, verse 10, we're to be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. I'm to prefer all of you before myself. You're to prefer everybody before yourself. That's following Jesus. Romans 12, verse 16, uh, be of the same mind one to another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem the other better than themselves. Humility. Submission, it's the stuff of order that's living under the influence of God. And Jesus Christ is to be the foundation of every relationship we have, and ground zero is marriage. That's next week. We'll pick it up in verse 23 there. But here we live in a deluded world filled with darkness, filled with thorns, a world that's made a covenant with death. How do we finish well our course? Not as fools, but wise. Not as unwise, but understanding the will of God. 
not drunk with wine, but filled with the Spirit. We're to live before God and man a lifestyle of under the influence of God, being filled with and led by the Holy Spirit, giving thanks always for all things to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ and submitting to him and submitting to each other, following Jesus. Amen? Amen. All right, if you stand with me. Father, thank you for your word. Jesus, you're the living word. You're the end of the law for righteousness for those who believe. You have not only spoken to us what it is that you would have us to do, but you've demonstrated it for us, and then you sent your spirit to give us the power to do that. May we turn our eyes to you. May we be watching and ready being accounted worthy to escape the things that are coming on this earth. May we keep our eyes on you. Please lift our head this day, every day, that we would see you and help us to not waste time, but to take every opportunity to serve you. Every of the appointed days you've given unto us. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.